I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 1, Chapter 13, Did Shakespeare Collaborate? Of course, we know that Shakespeare collaborated in the acting of plays on the stage, but this question is, did he collaborate in authorship? There are a few plays and poems called Shakespeare's in which scholars have discerned one or more authorial hands that are not his. For two, the two noble kinsmen and Sir Thomas More, we have good external evidence of collaboration. For a very few others, the only evidence is internal that is, the style of the writing itself. The arguments for and against Shakespeare's sole authorship of these plays have waxed and waned over the years. This much we can say for sure. Anyone who believes that Shakespeare was just another good playwright, like the others of the age, need only read a play known to be by Shakespeare and one known to be by anyone else. The reader's actual experience will be all the evidence needed to see the difference. Any reader may then bring that experience to bear on trying to discern where the seams lie when it comes to the few plays or poems in which Shakespeare may not have had the only hand. Of course, critics and scholars have brought their much greater experience and sometimes elaborate computer techniques to bear on the question, sometimes but not always helpfully. Where they all agree, we can be fairly confident of their conclusions. Where they don't, we are left to ourselves to divide up the assignment of specific passages between Shakespeare and his collaborators. In this podcast, I am going to address briefly the works thought to be collaborations, and I'll give you my general take first so as not to keep you in pointless suspense. Edward III. Shakespeare's work with significant collaboration possible, but not certain. Edward III was printed in 1596, but had probably been performed earlier, for the title page reads, The reign of King Edward III, as it hath been sundry times played about the city of London. The mystery arises because no author is listed. Critics are more or less in agreement that four scenes are by Shakespeare, the three so-called countess scenes, Act 1, Scene 2, and Act 2, Scenes 1 and 2, and then Act 4, Scene 4. This conclusion is fairly obvious because of the apparent connection of various parts of these scenes to Shakespeare's Rape of Lucrece, Measure for Measure, and Henry V, and because of the appearance in Act 2, Scene 1, Line 451, of Line 14 of Shakespeare's Sonnet 94. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. The use of dramatic antithesis, the preoccupation with conflicting loyalties, and other elements point to Shakespeare's imagination at work. His use and treatment of them, however, though they are signatures of Shakespeare's art and of no one else's writing at the time, suggest a young Shakespeare just learning the craft perhaps even younger than he was when writing the Henry VI plays. The end-stopped lines and more obvious metaphors of the other scenes of the play may indicate either that the whole play is a reworking by Shakespeare of an earlier play, or that a collaborator was involved. But though the lines are somewhat less inspired, and the metaphors less complex, nonetheless, some antitheses and some themes nudge us toward the possibility that Shakespeare did write the entire play, but did so as an aspiring playwright not yet the master that he was to become, even by the time of the Henry VI plays and Richard III. The conquest of France by Edward III and several of his sons serves as the background to Shakespeare's two later tetralogies, it is perfectly conceivable that Shakespeare set himself to write a play about that king and conquest before setting out to write the plays about the civil wars among Edward's descendants that lasted until Henry VII, grandfather of Elizabeth I, ended the conflict and established the Tudor dynasty. If Edward III, a pageant similar in structure to Henry VIII, is that play, it is interesting to note that Shakespeare both begins and ends his career 
with pageants that bracket his two history tetralogies. In Edward III, one can see the young Shakespeare already using the techniques that would later become, though far more subtly, his most pervasive in constructing his dramas. Verbal and dramatic antithesis, reversal of expectations, omens coming true, virtue and self-interest at loggerheads, character foils, and a whole library of classical and biblical allusions, to say nothing of the combination of familiarity and inventiveness in his use of metaphor. Why, then, was the play not more popular? And why did Hemming and Condell not include it in their first folio edition? The answer may be, and many have believed, that it was excluded because the editors thought the play not or not wholly by Shakespeare. My own impression is that the play is by a young Shakespeare learning his trade. That impression is shared by Giorgio Melchiori, editor of the new Cambridge edition, 1998. He argues that the play fell out of favor because its negative portrayal of David II, King of Scotland, evoked a public protest. In addition, by the time Hemming and Condell were preparing Shakespeare's collected works for publication, 1623, King James VI of Scotland had been King James I of England for twenty years, and the anti-Scottish passages in the play might have endangered the entire publication. It is to the credit of the editors of several modern editions, the Riverside edition, the Arden edition, and the Oxford edition, that Edward III is now included among the Shakespearean canon and therefore available so that readers may decide the question for themselves. Pericles Shakespeare's work with significant collaboration possible, but not certain. The situation of the text of Pericles is extremely obscure, so that it is difficult to come to a final conclusion about who else besides Shakespeare may be behind the play we have. The only early text of the play is Quarto I, 1609, a bad quarto, meaning a text reconstructed from memory by actors who had performed in one or more live productions of the play, as I discussed in the podcast of Series 1, Chapter 9. The play was not included in the first folio for reasons we do not know. Some argue that it might have been because the editors knew the play not to be entirely Shakespeare's, but there is no proof of such a conjecture. They may have excluded it because their edition purported to be printed, quote, according to the true original copies, and they found the bad quarto of Pericles to be unacceptably corrupt. In any case, most readers perceive that Acts 1 and 2 of Pericles are different in tone and style from Acts 3, 4, and 5, and that Shakespeare is certainly responsible for the later Acts. The differences in the two parts of the play have caused some scholars to speculate that the manuscript behind the bad quarto, retrieved and reconstructed by memory, was reported by two different people, one better than the other. This theory has been generally rejected in favor of the theory of dual authorship. But, as Hallett Smith writes, it is difficult to believe that a play so disparate in its parts could have been the result of a planned collaboration in which Shakespeare was one of the partners, particularly if we take Henry VIII and the two noble kinsmen to be examples of what such collaboration actually produced. A much likelier hypothesis is that Shakespeare revised the play by another hand. But if so, whose? And what did he do to it? Could Shakespeare's collaborator have been a brothel keeper called George Wilkins, as Jonathan Bate, co-editor of the Royal Shakespeare Company's Shakespeare Complete Works, believes? Perhaps Shakespeare picked up an old play, or a new play imitating the old plays, as was the fashion, left the first two acts more or less intact, and thoroughly revised the last three. If so, whose old play, or new play, was he revising? Various scholars have proposed various names, but none has been agreed upon. Or perhaps Shakespeare intentionally recreated in Acts 1 and 2 
the newly popular old-fashioned style in imitation of the poetry of Geoffrey Chaucer's contemporary, John Gower, circa 1330 to 1408, whose Confessio Amantis, Book Eight, provides one of the two main sources for the story, and then shifted into his own late style in Acts 3 through 5, so that the whole play is his after all. If only we had a good original text of the play, we might be able to answer some of these questions. But between us and whatever Shakespeare did write stands the faulty memorial reconstruction of a live play. We seem, therefore, to be permanently left with guesswork and scholarly frustration. Nonetheless, whatever readers feel about the problem of the authorship of the first two acts, by the time the play ends, Shakespeare has made of Pericles a great and moving drama. It is a profound study of loss and recovery, of destiny and virtue, of patience and divine intervention, of good triumphing only at the very last over misfortune and evil. As such, it serves well as the first of Shakespeare's four last romances, each suffused with spiritual insight and mystical poetry. I discussed these in session two of chapter ten in series one. Let no one ignore this play because not all the words may be Shakespeare's. It is a tribute to Shakespeare's greatness that even through the vehicle of a bad memorial reconstruction, his poetic genius can so compel our imaginations and illuminate our minds and hearts. Henry VIII. Shakespeare's work with possible but not significant collaboration. Henry VIII was written in early 1613, probably to celebrate the wedding of the Princess Elizabeth, daughter of King James I, to Prince Frederick, the Elector Palatine, leader of the German Protestant Union. That wedding was on February 14th. We know the play was being performed at the Globe on June 29th because eyewitnesses who called it a new play, report that the firing of cannons called for in the stage direction at Act 1, Scene 4, Line 49, Chambers Discharged, caused the Globe Theatre to burn to the ground on that day. Hence we conclude that Shakespeare wrote Henry VIII after his retirement from the theatre, to which he was probably alluding in the epilogue of The Tempest, written around 1611 to 1612. Henry VIII is a history based mostly on Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles, Volume 3, 1587, and bits from John Fox's Acts and Monuments, 1597. But it is not a drama like the Henry IV plays. Rather, it is a pageant, in structure more like Edward III and Henry V, also discussed in Session 2 of Chapter 10. Because it was written late in Shakespeare's career, because it aims more at pageantry than at drama, and because therefore it lacks the soaring poetry of Shakespeare's finest art, many have felt the play not to be very good. In truth, it is good at what it aims to do, but bringing the wrong expectations to it makes it seem to be rather workaday Shakespeare. Until the 19th century, the authorship of the play was not questioned. It was included in the first folio, 1623, in which the editors, Hemming and Condell, Shakespeare's friends and fellow shareholders in the theatre, were committed to reproducing the true original copies of Shakespeare's plays. The authenticity of Shakespeare's authorship is reinforced by the fact that those editors of the first folio are known to have excluded other plays for which we have external evidence of Shakespeare's collaboration with John Fletcher, 1579 to 1625, namely Two Noble Kinsmen and Cardinio. I'll discuss Cardinio in the podcast of chapter 14. However, in 1850, in an article in Gentleman's Magazine, J. Spedding argued that about half the play was written by Fletcher. Spedding's arguments were based on internal evidence alone, that is, style, diction, sentence structure, and so on, 
there being no external factual evidence of collaboration. Many have followed Spedding in believing in this collaboration with Fletcher, though they differ about which passages should be ascribed to him. Many have argued equally persuasively against the collaboration. Cyrus Hoy, taking a middle path, argued that Fletcher was responsible for parts of the play, but fewer than Spedding had claimed. He believed that Fletcher did, quote, nothing more than touch up a Shakespearean passage or insert a passage of his own in a Shakespearean context, and that Fletcher is assuredly there, but not so much as has been claimed. The arguments for Fletcher's hand in the play are largely fueled by critics' conviction that the play is not so good as Shakespeare would have made it were he working alone. The arguments against it are fueled by the conviction that the play exhibits, given its purposes, a thoroughly Shakespearean tone and quality. My own conclusion is that, though small bits of the play may be written or touched up by Fletcher, the overall impression of the play is of a single mind at work, and that mind Shakespeare's. Though the play does not achieve the depths of the great earlier histories, it nonetheless exhibits the same spirit as that seen in Shakespeare's most recently preceding plays, Pericles, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest. Here, as there, virtue, grace, forgiveness, religious humility, and the hope for joy overcome evil pride and social disharmony and result in triumphant celebration. Of this spirit, Fletcher would have been incapable, as we can see from the works he wrote on his own. No true appreciation of this play depends on attempting to surmise the relatively insignificant role, if any, that Fletcher played in writing it. For better or for worse, Henry VIII is most likely Shakespeare's. The Two Noble Kinsmen Shakespeare's work with significant collaboration almost certain. The Riverside Shakespeare properly categorizes the two noble kinsmen among the romances, with which it fits in date and atmosphere. Its story is a retelling of the Knight's Tale, the longest in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which Chaucer had taken from an even longer story in Boccaccio. In the play, the drawn-out conflict between the two noble cousins, who are both in love with the same girl, in the end cannot be resolved by human beings. The resolution is achieved not even by the great hero Duke Theseus, but only by the ineffable gods, in this case Mars, Venus, and Diana. Addressing the gods in the concluding scene, Act 5, Scene 4, Lines 131 to 136, Theseus says, O oh, you heavenly charmers, what things you make of us! For what we lack, we laugh. For what we have, are sorry. Still are children in some kind. Let us be thankful for that which is, and with you leave dispute that are above our question. Leave dispute means leave off or cease disputation. In that are above our question, the word that refers to the gods, and above our question means beyond the power of human reasoning. Both the style and the sentiment here are characteristic of Shakespeare's last plays. But The Two Noble Kinsmen is the only play in the generally accepted canon of Shakespeare's works for which we have external as well as internal evidence of divided authorship. The external evidence for collaboration includes both the title page of the first quarto, 1634, and the entry in the Stationer's Register for April 8, 1634, which lists William Shakespeare and John Fletcher as the authors. According to Jonathan Bate, co-editor of the Royal Shakespeare Company's Shakespeare Complete Works, Shakespeare was, quote, grooming Fletcher to take over as the in-house dramatist for his acting company, The King's Men. The internal evidence for collaboration with Fletcher lies in the differences in the two characteristic styles of the play. Parts of the play sound like Shakespeare, parts like other plays we know to be by Fletcher. 
scholars are fairly confident in being able to divide the play into the scenes that are by Shakespeare and those that are by Fletcher. Shakespeare's are Act 1, Scene 1, through Act 2, Scene 1, Act 3, Scene 1, Act 5, Scene 1, lines 34 to 173, and Act 5, Scenes 3 and 4. Fletcher's are the prologue, Act 2, Scenes 2 through 6, Act 3, Scene 2 through Act 5, Scene 1, line 33, Act 5, Scene 2, and the epilogue. There are a few short scenes that remain questionable. The weightier scenes depicting the main characters at the beginning and end of the play and their meeting in the middle are by Shakespeare. Much of the rest, including the subplot, is by Fletcher. Distinction in the two styles can be seen in the example of interlocking speeches. In a Fletcher passage, in Act 2, Scene 2, Palamon responds, "'Tis too true, our sight," line 45. In a Shakespeare passage, in Act 3, Scene 1, Arcite says, Dear Cousin Palamon, and Palamon responds, Cousiner, meaning cheater, Arcite, lines 42 to 44. Note how Fletcher shifts the speaker with a distancing rote phrase, while Shakespeare shifts the speaker with an earnest phrase and a punning response that increases the emotional stakes. Distinctions in content, too, can be discerned. In Fletcher's subplot, a doctor advises the honest wooer of the jailer's daughter, not yet married to her, to go to bed with her in order to cure her of the madness caused by unrequited love. The good doctor's cavalier attitude to woman's chastity is characteristic of Fletcher's work, but far from the devotion to chastity of Shakespeare's good characters in all his plays, from the early Much Ado About Nothing to the late Tempest. As I discussed in Chapter 12 on Shakespeare's other poems, in A Lover's Complaint, which I take to be by Shakespeare, the maiden's final self-defense of her breach of chastity is also uncharacteristic of Shakespeare's plays. However, the doctor's recommendation of extramarital sex here in The Two Noble Kinsmen is unmitigated by the wit that underlies the ending of a lover's complaint. The likely date of two noble kinsmen is 1613, the same year as Henry VIII, though, unlike Henry VIII, a performance of which burnt down the Globe Theatre that year, the title page of the two noble kinsmen indicates that it was performed at the private Blackfriars Theatre. But like Henry VIII, it was written after Shakespeare's farewell to the public stage if we may take the epilogue of The Tempest in 1611 to indicate that retirement. Whether Shakespeare had finally settled in Stratford at this point, or remained in London, or continued to travel back and forth between the two, is not known, and we have no evidence of how or why the collaboration with Fletcher was formed. Was Shakespeare grooming Fletcher to take his place, as Jonathan Bate conjectures? Was Fletcher sent by the company to Stratford to beg Shakespeare to write another play, or maybe both two noble kinsmen and Henry VIII? Did Shakespeare and Fletcher divvy up the scenes of a projected play, major dramatic scenes versus the rest? Was Shakespeare asked to fill out a play Fletcher had begun writing? Did Shakespeare begin writing the two noble kinsmen and then tire and send the partial manuscript to Fletcher to be completed? Without evidence, we are free to speculate. What is sure is that Shakespeare's voice, style, and imagination are clearly at work in some parts of the play and missing from others that bear the stamp of Fletcher's style. Sir Thomas More Shakespeare's Work with Significant Collaboration Certain In the British Library, there is a manuscript of a play called Sir Thomas More. It was apparently never printed until the editor Alexander Dice, 1798-1869, published it for the Shakespeare Society in 1844, and we have no evidence that it was ever acted in its day. What we do know is that the manuscript is written in the handwritings of six different people, 
one theatrical scribe, Han C., and five playwrights whose names we know. Henry Chettle, Hand A, probably Thomas Haywood, Hand B, Thomas Decker, Hand E, and Anthony Munday, Hand S. Except for the passage written in Hand D, the play, as G. Blakemore Evans writes, never rises above more or less competent mediocrity. No one but scholars would be interested in the manuscript if it were not for one thing. Hand D is most probably that of William Shakespeare. Scholars base the attribution of the Hand D passages to Shakespeare on comparisons of the handwriting with the very few other examples of Shakespeare's hand that we have, on comparison of spelling and punctuation to passages in the quartos and folios thought to be closest to Shakespeare's manuscripts, on Shakespeare's characteristic vocabulary, meter, and, quote, what R. W. Chambers calls the expression of ideas. As G. Blakemore Evans writes in his introduction in the Riverside Shakespeare, Sir Thomas More belongs to a group of chronicle histories or semi-historical dramas on well-known English figures. The life of More, his rise from Sheriff of London to Lord Chancellor of England, with his fall and execution, affords the loose plotline of the play. End quote. The source for the play is Hollinshed's Chronicles, 1587 edition, which gives a, quote, quite detailed account of the so-called Ill May Day Riot of 1517, in which, historically, Moore tried and failed to control and win over the rioters. It is that event that is depicted in the passage of the manuscript written in Hand D. However, in that passage, Unlike in Hollinshed, Moore succeeds in quelling the mob of commoners. He does so with a fine speech that has much in common with others Shakespeare wrote, among them that of Ulysses in Troilus and Cressida, Act 1, C3, line 75 and following, and that of Menenius in Coriolanus, Act 1, C1. The ill May Day riot was an uprising against foreign workers, bankers, and merchants from the continent who were perceived to be an economic and perhaps a social threat to native Englishmen. Based on the similarity of those riots in Moore's London to events taking place in Shakespeare's London, we can surmise that Sir Thomas More was written during 1592 to 1593, years in which, to quote Evans, the London merchants and shopkeepers had surreptitiously circulated various libels against strangers then living and conducting business in London, e.g. French, Flemish, Dutch, and Lombards, who were viewed as posing a serious threat to the native English business ventures. Apparently, they even incited their apprentices and journeymen to violence. End quote. It is no doubt because of the danger of an uprising by the commoners that Sir Edmund Tilney, the master of the rebels, and therefore the government censor, quoting Evans again, called for very substantial deletions and revisions in Sir Thomas More, as evidenced particularly by a note at the beginning of the manuscript. Quote, Leave out the insurrection wholly and the cause thereof, and begin with Sir Thomas More at the mayor's session, with a report afterwards of his good service done being sheriff of London upon a mutiny against the Lombards only by a short report and not otherwise, at your own perils. At your own perils meant at the risk of displeasing the crown and incurring punishment. It was politically and practically dangerous to depict an insurrection from the past in a London on the brink of insurrection in the present. Perhaps because of this injunction from Sir Edmund Tilney, or perhaps to forestall it, Shakespeare was called in to revise the insurrection scene, contradicting the historical source by giving Sir Thomas More a powerful speech that turned the tide and quelled the fictional mob. However, the play as we have it, even with Shakespeare's contribution, does not adhere to Sir Edmund's injunctions, for the insurrection and the cause thereof that were to be wholly left out 
still appear. It is therefore highly likely that the political climate is what prevented the play from being produced or printed before the 19th century. One can see his uncommon imagination at work in the two additions to the manuscript of Sir Thomas More ascribed to Shakespeare, additions two and three. In one addition, Shakespeare has More offer an argument in favor of keeping to the order and hierarchy of society. In the other addition, he has More give voice to a meditation on the temptations of power. Both are worth reading. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare.